The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station, JVC Broadcasting Management, or its sponsors. Welcome to Crime and Justice Radio, where we talk all things crime, justice, mayhem in the courts with expert insiders and legal outcasts. I'm your host, Aida Leisenring, here with Bruce Barquette. Hello, Bruce. Good evening, Aida. How are you? I'm well. Notice I didn't use your last name. Yeah, my, my mother didn't like it. She said, just go with Aida. Oh, excellent, <laughs> excellent. So Aida it is from this day forward, permission from your mom. But in court, it's still Miss Licensing. Yes, of course, of course, and with clients. Uh, I am looking forward to tonight's show. It, it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. What do we got? We have an amazing show for you today. We have Sarah Edmondson, an actress, author, featured on HBO's The Vow, and an ex-member of Nexium, which is a celebrity sex trafficking cult posing as an elite self-help organization led by Keith Raniere, who was convicted of sex trafficking, racketeering, child pornography charges, and was sentenced to 120 years, and will probably be filing his appeal shortly. Sarah, who was literally branded with Keith Raniere's initials, will be joined by her husband, actor and director, and also an ex, an ex Nexium member, Nippy Ames. And Sarah and Nippy will tell us about how they bravely blew the whistle on Nexium. I, I got to stop for a second and go back to literally branded. What does that mean? It means that uh, they took a. Uh, branding pen, I don't even know how to pronounce it, and branded her in her pelvic region. And to me, that is horrific, but it's not even the most horrifying thing about what they underwent. So we'll hear all about it. And it is fascinating. It is multi-layered. They will not be able to fully answer every question we have because it's so immersive. But Fascinating. Fascinating. We're going to start off uh, in just a minute with uh, John Laturco who is the Laturco that's part of our firm, who is representing Michael Valva, uh, who's been going through pretrial hearings. And we want to hear from John about how he ended up being uh, Mr. Valva's lawyer and about anything he can tell us about the defense. And we also are going to discuss the pending execution of Quentin Jones. And unfortunately, I think imminent execution. Uh, It's a tragic case of Quentin Jones, who's scheduled to be executed in Texas in less than two days. The victim's family is begging for his life to be spared. So we're going to talk about why that should matter. Well, the victim's family is his family since he murdered his great aunt. Correct. And we're going to start off with John Laturco. Um, John, are you with us? I am. Good evening, Bruce and Aida. Hello, John. Good, good evening. This is John is one of our partners and is also an expert insider that Aida refers to, particularly in Suffolk County, uh, one of the uh, perennial lawyers in, in, in the county, really on Long Island, but specifically in Suffolk. And my last pre-pandemic trial was in Suffolk County with John Laturco. Uh, uh, yeah, excellent. And you, you both got an acquittal in that case, yep, which yes, was spectacular. John, uh, let's start off. I mean, everybody knows about this, that that Valva is accused of murdering his son by letting him freeze to death in his garage. And we know that Mr. Valva, although he's uh, now a fired police officer, uh, had uh, an inability to obtain a lawyer. He couldn't afford one for a case like this, and nobody would represent him. How did it come to pass that you are his lawyer? That is correct. Mr. Valva had no resources, or especially limited resources, to defend himself in such a difficult case. So I was assigned pursuant to what's called the 18A panel. That is a panel that uh, administers representation for the indigent, people who cannot afford representation. So the 18A administrator was attempting to find a attorney for Mr. Valva, and he requested from numerous panel members, attorneys, to have them represent Mr. Valva in his defense. No one, not any panel member, would represent Mr. Valva. I was a former panel member, and I saw Mr. Valva going to court unrepresented, 
on numerous occasions, and the panel reached out to me and asked me if I would do that. Although I was greatly hesitant, no one else would do it based upon the egregious nature of the allegations. I consulted with two of the most important entities in my life. One was, naturally, my family, who gave me their support, and the other was, of course, our law firm. Barquette Epstein, and thankfully, my partners also gave me overwhelming support, and uh, I was thereafter assigned by the court, and here we are today at the pretrial hearings, which are still continuing. Look, I, I know it's a little self-serving to praise you, uh, because you're, you're one of us, uh, part of the firm, but you really deserve a tremendous amount of credit for doing this. We all know that you're, uh, maybe the people don't know, you're getting paid a fraction of what you would normally command in any case, specifically in a case like this, and you're doing it be, in, in the highest, the highest um, calling of our profession is to represent individuals who are accused of crimes. Uh, and I know that the media has convicted Mr. Valva, and I know that a lot of people think he should just be taken out and sentenced without the benefit of a trial, but we've seen case after case after case where individuals who were thought were guilty, Marty Tankliff, uh, being comes to mind, who it turns out didn't do it. So you're doing a, a great thing here. Does, does Mr. Valva actually have a defense? He certainly does, Bruce. Uh, as you know, Mr. Valva is being charged with, as well as his co-defendant, his ex fiance Angela Polina. They're both being charged with murder in the second degree, which carries a sentence of 25 to life. He has defenses. He, first of all, he had no intent to commit his son's death. That's unquestioned. H how's he doing he emotionally, if I can interrupt? Well, from the moment I met him, he was emotionally distraught. Uh, he was borderline suicidal. In fact, he was on suicide watch when I met him and had been on suicide watch for a period of nine months or so. Uh, he's doing a little better now that he can focus on his defense. And that's what he's focused on right now, presently. But essentially, uh, he does have defenses. Uh, during the day of the incident, he certainly called 911. He tried to perform CPR. And he, in fact, he did perform CPR on his son to no avail, unfortunately. He invited the police and uh, emergency personnel to come to perform aid on his son. In no way did he intend to cause his son death. And in fact... Uh, we feel it was an accidental death, and that's the type of defense that we're going to be putting forward through experts and through uh, other witnesses, and we certainly have a defense for Mr. Valva in that regard. And, I, you know, I'd like to point out that, uh, and I appreciate your praise, Bruce, but I think you would have done the same thing, and I know other people would have as well. Uh, one of my heroes is Clarence Darrow, and he has stated, saw a plaque on my wall, says a criminal defense lawyer must be prepared to be hated, isolated, as few love a spokesman for the despised and the damned. But our country depends upon the Sixth Amendment, which is a right to counsel. And we believe in the advocacy system. And without it, without both sides presenting full, uh, zealous representation, whether you're a prosecutor or a criminal defense attorney, the system would break down. And it's a great quote. And, you know, we often represent people that uh, may not be guilty of the top charge, but are guilty of something, or uh, sometimes we're fortunate enough to assist in the exoneration of innocent people. But sometimes we represent the guilty and seek mercy for them. And we develop a relationship with the client and we learn a, a lot about them and they treat us with respect. And of course, we treat them with respect back. So let me ask you this. Michael Valva is quite literally the most vilified, accused defendant in Suffolk County right now. Can you tell us a little about Valva the man? Does he have any redeeming qualities? Because the media certainly has not shed light on that. You know, it's a great question, Aida. I've spent a lot of time with Michael Valva, whether it's uh, at the jail or even during courtroom proceedings, and he does have a lot of redeeming qualities. First of all, he loves all of his children, and he also loved 
young Thomas Valva, who unfortunately is now deceased. Uh, if you watch the home videos that I've seen, uh, the, I've been in his home. I've seen all the photographs of his family together, loving photographs. He's spoken to me about uh, Thomas. He was a, he was a father of uh, of a family of two autistic young children. He had difficulty raising him, no doubt about it. But he was a police officer that had accommodations. Uh, he w- was loved by his mother, is loved by his mother and other family members. And uh, I've spoken with him at great length. He's funny at times, even though he's obviously distraught. But uh, he's a likable guy. He's meek. He's soft-spoken. He is not the person that is being personified by well, the media in any respect. John, he is lucky to have you. Good luck with it. We hope to have you back as the case proceeds. Uh, keep doing uh, good work out there. It's spectacular. Spectacular. You guys are doing great radio, great entertainment. <laughs> you guys keep up the good work. As well. Thank you, we'll John. I'm going to take a short break um, to pay some bills, as they say. And I want to thank our firm for sponsoring the show. The firm is Barquette, Epstein, Kiran, Aldea, and Laturco. We are a litigation firm that handles everything from the most complex federal, criminal, or civil matters to a straightforward DWI or car accident case. We have an appellate group that is led by one of the best appellate attorneys in the state, Donna Aldea, and we have expert insiders, as you just heard from one, John Laturco, and we have those from every borough from... Uh, New York City to Long Island, including a retired judge with offices in New York City, Garden City, Huntington. We really can handle cases from the Hudson to the Hamptons. You can reach us at 516-745-1500 or visit our website at www.barquetteepstein.com. What do we have next, Aida? Uh, We have a a case that to me is just heartbreaking. Uh, When it comes to the death penalty, it is uh, supposed to be doled out, if it's supposed to be doled out at all, for the worst of the worst. And in two days, Texas is scheduled to execute Quentin Jones. And I want to tell you a little about Quentin Jones, who he is, and what his crime was. And the listeners can make up their minds on whether this is the worst of the worst. Quentin Jones was convicted of killing his great aunt in 1999 when he was 20 years old. He's been on death row for over 20 years, but Jones himself experienced brutal conditions during his childhood. He was neglected by his parents. He was sexually abused by his sister or stepsister when he was seven years old. His mother threatened him with a gun when he was a young kid, and he himself shot himself twice, uh, once in the hand to placate a gang member, and later in the chest in a suicide attempt. He had mental health issues. He became addicted to drugs by his early teen years, and what he did, killing his great aunt, was wrong. He showed remorse almost immediately. He admitted his guilt at trial, but nonetheless, over 20 years ago, he was sentenced to death. Uh, and, and as I understand it, the, we spoke about this just a minute ago, his family, the victim's family, has literally said they don't want him to be executed. They, they want him to be spared, and not that they want him home with them. He's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Um, but the, the quote from him is that he... I know, this is, this is Quentin Jones speaking, I know instead of dying on the 19th, two days from now, I'll die years later, but it won't be in the free world. It'll be in a prison. And I can accept that because there are other avenues in prison that I can take to better myself and better others along the way. That was his plea for clemency, uh, indicating that he's not trying to get out of jail. He understands he's going to die in prison either way. Um, but he's helped a lot of people out in prison. He's had a pen pal that... Uh, had leukemia, wrote a book about her friendship with him and how he gave her hope. His brother and uh, the victim's sister, Maddie Long, have both been advocating uh, fervently for 
uh, mercy for him. The brother says, both of us have long forgiven Quinn. Please don't cause us to be victimized again through Quinn's execution. Think about that for a second. The victim's family is going to feel real pain, another horrific loss in their life, because somebody or some group of people in Texas feel the need to execute uh, which, another another individual. Which is, by the way, for those who say, I'm not going to let my tax dollars go to keeping someone alive in prison for the rest of their lives, according to the Death Penalty Information Center, the average cost of a death penalty case is $2.3 million. Wow. And that's about three times the cost of imprisoning someone in a single cell at the highest security prison for 40 years. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, you know, th- th- we're going to talk about the death penalty over and over and over again because it's something we both feel strongly about. Uh, one of the things that happened today that I'm going to mention quickly is that Henry McMaster, the governor of South Carolina, just signed a bill into law that um, will restart, he hopes, the death penalty in South Carolina because they haven't been able to get the drugs to uh, administer a lethal injection to the prisoners, they're going to give them the opportunity. And I say this with a chuckle because it's so mind-bogglingly stupid in my view. They're going to give the prisoners the choice of either being killed by electrocution or killed by a firing squad. Would you like to be shot to death or electrocuted? Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. We'll come back to that. Um, We'll have an update on Quentin Jones next week. Hopefully, um, it'll be a good update. We'll see. But let's move to our our guests for this evening. And and, uh, I... First of all, I I know Sarah Edmondson. I know Nippy Ames. Nippy Ames, I've known since I was 14 years old. We went to Hotchkiss Boarding School together. We both graduated from Brown University. Bragging about your education. Yes, our fancy education. I've seen him uh, throughout the years for coffee here and there when he's in New York. And they're a wonderful family. Um, And you would never guess that Sarah and Nippy were both high-ranking members of Nexium, one of the world's most sophisticated sex trafficking organizations run by Keith Ranieri, who was reputed to have a 240 IQ, literally Guinness Book of World Records claimed he was a mega genius. And uh, the way he attracted members was by posing as a personal development group, teaching an alleged patent pending technology called rational thought. So uh, Nixian members weren't your cliche religious fanatics. They were elite They were diverse. They were highly educated from Seagram's Harris's to Hollywood actresses like Alison Mack of Smallville, descendants of the royal family, the son of Mexico's former president, and it was endorsed by the Dalai Lama himself. But behind the curtains is a twisted story of how Nexium indoctrinated and emotionally tortured its members. And tactics range from sleep deprivation to forced labor, starvation, human freight experiments, branding, extortion, sex with Rainier, child trafficking, and pornography. And if you realized that something was amiss and wanted to get away, you couldn't. If you wanted to report him, you couldn't. And why couldn't you? Because they would collect blackmail. That was blackmail information as a form of collateral. And this was supposed to be experiment, trainings, and trust, right? But as soon as you tried to get away, they would threaten to release the collateral, which would be naked photos, videos, financial banking information, wills, um, and intimidate you, close off your banking accounts. So it's it's insane. But we have two very brave people that bared it all and took a huge risk and took on a global organization. Sarah and Nippy, I'm not even done with your introduction, but I'll stop and let you inform us more. How are you doing? Good. How are you? (laughs) Can you guys hear us? Yeah, we can. Can you hear us? We can. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. How How are you seduced? You want to go first? Sure. I think the best way to describe that for your listeners is to explain that I was dangled my dreams and given everything that I wanted or thought that I wanted in terms of a community and a program to do the the work that I thought that I needed to do to have the life that I wanted. And at that time, that was 
it still is now, personal development, self-awareness, those, those are all great things. Um, but behind that was, as you mentioned very eloquently in your introduction just now, um, some very deceptive behaviors that were not obviously on the surface. As n- nobody joined the cult on purpose. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, Sarah, Nippy, welcome. Uh, we're going to hear some more. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes to, to pay some bills. Um, and with some commercials, but I want to hear more specifically about how you went from self-help to um, corporal punishment, uh, the branding, and then ultimately how you got the courage to face down the blackmail information they had or said they had on you to actually turn these individuals in, uh, especially um, the leader of the group. And literally, you were the impetus that brought this down. And he's now, this individual is now doing 120 years because of what you, your bravery. So we want to hear about that. We will be back in just a second to talk to you again. Thanks. Welcome back to Crime and Justice Radio. I'm Bruce Barquette with my co-host, Aida Lysenring. We are interviewing uh, Sarah... Sarah Edmondson, Edmondson and Nippy Ames. Nippy Ames. And uh, they were the whistleblowers that got the ball rolling ultimately to the prosecution of Keith Rainier, the leader of the uh, ultimate cult, cult money laundering organization and so forth. Now, Nippy and Sarah, I finally watched The Vow on HBO, and I had no idea that the you know you guys were the most among the most prominently f- featured individuals. But I also learned a lot about what I thought Nippy had been doing all these years in Nexium, and I showed it to Bruce, and Bruce went, "Oh my God, I would sign up right now for that." Yeah, yeah. A lot of people say that, and I think the directors did a good job of uh, explaining how people uh, would get involved with something like this, as opposed to just focusing on the salacious aspect and saying it's crazy. And it doesn't give any nuance to how and why people would um, do get involved with it and what people actually liked about it. Right. And there's so many self help groups today, right? I mean, there's I could list a laundry name of of reputable self-help groups that a lot of CEOs entertain and sign up for to improve their public speaking skills and so forth. And I was watching this and I was like, you're not just learning a methodology, you're creating this amazing networking experience. If you're an actress, you meet film directors. If you're a CEO, you meet people with like brilliant business ideas. And frankly, like everyone seemed super good looking and nice. Like I wanted to be part of that as I was watching it. Is, is well, that group, uh, when, I, when I initially did it in 2001, I was there for about a year and a half, two years, and it, it just, I got what I wanted and left. And then when I came back in 2006, because they invited me back to work on a film, it was a totally different organization. And that's when Sarah and Mark Vicente and all the... We made it people. cool, let's be honest. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> you made it cool. You, you made it very cool. Did, you you uh, all met. I, Didn't you meet in the group? Yeah, we uh, met there and and we're friends for a while. Didn't date till later on, but yeah. uh, that was the silver lining. Right. And you have two children now, right? Yep. yep. So, so as with as with many things, it, it it's what well, you said that it's not black or white. It was more subtle than that, where it actually had some good aspects to it, some good people involved, but somehow it went really, really um, askew, really bad. Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about from your own journey how it went from the self-help group where you met your husband and so forth to the... Sure. Yeah. I mean, what, what I've learned is that it, it's, it was called, they, they can't say what they're actually doing on the out front and no one would sign up. So there's a bait and switch that exists as, as exists with any con or any, anyone who's trying to manipulate somebody, they present a different persona. And the persona that I was involved with was a personal development program that was helping me live my best life, helping me achieve my goals, helping me work through my barriers, limitations, limiting beliefs. And that's what I thought I was part of. And Aida, you're totally right. It was it was the networking, it was community, it was a way of being. And it started from being just, you know, a training I took on recommendation from a filmmaker I really respected 
to becoming something that I decided to bring to Vancouver, open my own center here, which is part of the reason why I never saw a lot of the bad stuff is that I was, I was focused on the business in Vancouver. I didn't go to Albany that much. And every time you sort of want to move on with your life or maybe become less distance, it reel you back in with some, some motivation, some promotion, some incentive. And, you know, that was my journey for 12 years in different levels of, of, um, participation. And then ultimately at the end, um, I don't know what you want to get into that quite yet or what was, I think I cut you off. Well, no, 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 I mean, but so in doing so you developed literally best friends or people you believe to be best friends, right? hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, one it's, of um, among them, I think was Claire Brothman, right? No, Claire was never a friend to be honest. Ah, it was not. Lauren was. was. Lauren was one of my close friends. She was my maid of honor and our children's godmother. And the woman who invited me to DOS, which is the thing that most people have heard about in the news in terms of the secret sorority of the women's group and, you know, where the eventual branding took place. Yeah, and that, that's, you're, you're right. That's where I was going to go, that you join a self-help group. And now you're an author and the name of your book is Scarred. Uh, and an obvious reference to the, uh, to the physical scar. How did you end up consenting to being branded? It's a great question. I mean, what most people want to know is why would you say yes to that? And it, it's really hard to explain and one of the reasons why I wrote the book or, or agreed to be a part of the vow is for people to be walked along the step-by-step process of how you go from, I want to take a training to help me with my goals to saying, Master, would you brand me? It would be an honor. Now, keep in mind that by the time I got to that point, I'd been indoctrinated with a belief system that was very upside down and now that i'm out and deprogrammed i can say that very clearly and also trust was abused. yeah my trust was abused and leveraged but i thought i was doing a women's program women only or i was going to go through an initiation ceremony not dissimilar to hazing in a sorority or do something with my with a group of women as my sisters and come out stronger and tougher on the other side that's how it was presented to me and i i don't want- I don't want people to think that this was, you know, they duped a, a few people that were uh, somehow vulnerable. The members of this group were the most, some were the most sophisticated people on the, on the planet. You know, the, the heirs to the Seagrams, to the Seagrams fortune, Seagrams whiskeys. Uh, the- and, and Lauren, who invited you to DOS, which was the secret sisterhood society, her, it was her mother that was running Nexium along with Keith Rainier. Am I right? Yeah. It's a president. She was the president of the company. So part of my persuasion and part of the responsibility I have to take is I felt like I needed to do it to be part of the company, to get promoted in the company, which is sort of the overall structure. And I'm sure this exists in many other places other than cult, where you feel like it's very difficult to say no to your, to the authority figures. In, to the superiors, which there were. It was very much based on a ranking system. Lauren was my best friend, but she was also above me in rank. And I, one thing I found interesting, too, in watching The Vow and just doing research on this is that her mother was actually a psychologist and was trained in hypnotherapy. So you're taking uh, something that's supposed to be a, a healing um, art or a healing science, and you're weaponizing that in the most sophisticated way. And here's someone who you believe to be your best friend who was, uh, you know, not second in command, but touching on the highest ranked individuals. And she's telling you, this is an honor. This is something that no one knows about. And if you don't trust us, then you don't deserve to go up in the ranks, so to speak. Uh, All of those things used against me. And also keep in mind to even hear about it or be a part of it. I had already given what they called collateral, which is a, a nice word of saying blackmail. And that was also used against me. Like, if you didn't agree to do what was being asked of you in the group, then that would be the collateral would be released. So that was acting as a gun to my head in the moment of, do I do this or not? You and know, knowing what I know now, I would have, you know, not have been indoctrinated like I was then. I would have told them what they, that they could go screw themselves and walk out the door. But I wasn't in that mindset. I thought that I, I, I very much felt like I had to. And um, that's how coercive control works. And so they got you to, to quote unquote, consent. But what's going yeah. on in your mind? There's 12 years of indoctrin- indoctrination. And 
this black man material that they had where you thought, geez, if I don't cooperate, this is going to go badly for me publicly, and you're a public figure, so that critically important yeah. to you. And exactly. One thing I'm very passionate about right now is looking at this concept of consent, which implies that you have all the information, which I did not. And what they had actively done is lied about who was involved, which is that Keith was at the top of this thing, orchestrating all of it, including looking at the collateral, much of which was nude photos from women. And that the the symbol, by the way, I was initially told I was getting a tattoo and the night of it was revealed it was a branding but I was told that the symbol was a, a symbol for the elements, and then the night of, um, that's what they told me the night of, and weeks later we figured out on our own that it was actually Keith's initials in a cryptic monogram, and that was the thing ultimately that woke me up. Not the branding itself, but realizing that I'd been lied to and that it, they had betrayed me and that I had Keith's initials in my body. And, and so, and but, and that, but, I'm, yeah. but, but that I'm curious about because yeah. I... And maybe I'm wrong, and correct me if I'm wrong. It couldn't have just been that deception, right? It was the deception of the whole thing. The whole, because you have to understand, like for years, there's been negative press. People have said, oh, you're in a cult. And I said, no, you're wrong. I'm in a group of people who are trying to grow and see that the humanitarian, and I vouch for this guy. So not only did I realize that I'd been deceived with the branding, I realized that. I was wrong for 12 years, and he was, in fact, a sociopath, sex-addicted, narcissistic. Right, and he was never who he was asserting himself to be. So you need to understand that a lot of a lot of the abuses of power came from the people around him who protected the image that he was portraying. And the people more peripheral had no idea of his real character and his real intent. But the people around him, as we've come to find out, were lying, and we underestimated their capacity to lie at the level that they were lying at. So... The people that were coming to take a training or a a goals program or something like that had no idea that stuff was going on, but the people around them did. When we, we're That's going to take a short break again, just 30 seconds or so. When we come back, I want to hear about what happened on the other side once you got out of the cult. And we're going to take a moment to thank our law firm, Aida, for uh, sponsoring the show. It's the reason why we're here. And uh, the firm is Barquette, Kieran, Aldea, and Laturco. Excuse me, Barquette, Epstein, Kieran, Aldea, and Laturco. I better not forget anybody's name. We're a litigation firm that handles everything from the most complex federal, criminal, and civil cases to straightforward DWIs or car accidents. And we have an outstanding appellate group, expert insiders in every borough and in both counties on Long Island, including a retired judge. We have offices in New York City, Garden City, and Huntington. We really can handle any litigation matter from the Hudson to the Hamptons. You can reach us at 516-745-1500 or visit our website at www.barquetteepstein.com. And we're back. And I, I want to talk to you about when you and Nippy decided to finally leave and how scary that was. And I say this, um, and I'd, I'd say hindsight, because looking at the intricacy of the kind of collateral they collected from people, and sometimes it wasn't just naked photos, right? It was bank account records, wills, information about family members, secrets about family members. Sometimes those secrets were fake, but it would be, you know, ruin someone's reputation. And you say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get out. What kind of scare tactics, if any, did they use to keep you at bay? Well, the scare tactics started with just setting a precedent with anyone who left. You know, here's the thing. People did come and go. As long as they went on good terms, they were fine. But if anyone left and said anything negative publicly or otherwise, they would be sued or harassed um, by Claire Brockman. Claire Brockman yeah. Who's the heiress to Seagram's? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Claire Bronfman and Sarah Bronfman were the heiress of Seagram's, and Claire Bronfman was basically propped up the company, as we found out since we've left, um, and basically litigated anyone who attacked you, Keith. So were you, were, did you suffer those fear tactics? Yeah. So yeah. what happened, like, I, I wasn't particularly scared of any scare tactics. I just thought they were going to come after us and we were going to be tied up in litigation for however long, because that, that that seemed to be the pattern. Um, but then Claire Bronfman, no less than a month after 
uh, we leave, which is June 1st of 17, um, flies out to Vancouver and tries to have my wife arrested for fraud and mischief. What was the other one? Theft. Theft. Oh, my God. I didn't return. I gave them back all of their notes, the iPads. It's called the technology. But I refused to give them back the student files because in the student files is basically everyone's deep, dark secret, like their worst moment, worst decision, including... And then also, like, the forms they fill out to apply, their visa information, their addresses. So basically, everyone's private information. I just said I'm not giving that back. You wanted to protect them. Uh, so to protect them, yeah. So That's what they were saying, yeah. As a res- we've been vocal about, about this, this company's not what you think it is. We told everyone. We were to, dissenters. Yeah, we told everyone to get out. This is dangerous. Like, Keith isn't who he says he is. And people were kind of, they were shocked. They didn't know to believe us. And so they were dealing with, People back in Albany saying we were lying, we made it all up. Were you uh, scared? I tell people I we made it all up. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I was scared. I mean, they have ties I, in I Mexico. and I mean, you opened up the Vancouver office. They have rich, powerful, indoctrinated You're, people put, with I put, collateral. I put, right. I put on more locks on my door, if that makes you understand what we were doing. But like in terms of the collateral, I knew... When we left, that my collateral might be released, and that was going to be the cost of destroying this thing. Like, that was already, like, I was prepared to do that. And You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and just for it's listeners just for, who, don't, who don't know, you guys tried to get law enforcement to do something about it, but no one initially did anything. Is that right? That was in the Northern District uh, FBI when I dropped you off. You say Northern yeah. District of New York in Albany. In New York, yeah. correct. The Northern District uh, is a federal it, district where they have the, just so people know, they, the federal prosecutors around the country are divided up into districts. And in New York, there's four, the Western, the Northern, the Eastern, and the Southern, and Albany's part of the Northern. So it's the U.S. Attorney's Office up there and the FBI. And then, yeah. and then uh, you agreed to tell your story to the New York Times and bear it all. <laughs> So yeah, here's what happened. Once that happened, we were in a, we were in a position after we told people to leave. We were in a position when Claire flew out that we were dragged into a situation where we we're going to have to defend ourselves. And what I was scared of, the most thing I was scared of, was having to be tied up in litigation for four to five years defending ourselves, and we didn't feel like we had anything to defend. And once that happened, we went to the New York Times. The New York Times had the article come out in October of seventeen. But we did that so that law enforcement would act. Right. And it worked. And, and it yeah. worked. <laughs> and it worked. And, and also the other thing that, that that Barry Meyer, who wrote the New York Times article, really focused on, I think was really important, is that he was showing how not only did I go to law enforcement, but I also wrote to the medical board. Um, and this was on advice. I would never have known to do this. On advice from Kristen Keefe, who was one of basically, he was she was Keefe's like, legal advisors. I don't even know if she has a law background, but basically taught herself law and and would do all the sneaky stuff and eventually woke up and left next to him with their son. And she contacted me when she heard that I was out and said, listen, you need to contact the medical board and tell them about the branding and tell them that you didn't consent to having, you know, having his initials on your body. And I filled out this form, which then became the proof that I had done all the things and everybody had ignored it. I've, I've, we're, we're unfortunately running out of time and I'm, I'm lucky I know you and I can call you back up sometime and ask you more questions if you'll yep. indulge me. But how, how do you wake others up, Sarah? Because, and, and Nippy, Sarah, you recruited all these individuals. I know you then tried to make sure that they knew what this was really about. How does one begin to wake up individuals that have been indoctrinated for years? It, honestly, it's really hard, but depending on the level of indoctrination, most people woke up pretty quickly because they didn't live in Albany in terms of people that I brought in. Right, it's case by case. And I just had to say, this happened to me. I didn't consent to it. It was, And some people, even, I even at the beginning, when I was still afraid of my collateral being released, I said, I can't tell you why I'm leaving, but I'm stepping down. And, and they just stepped down. They just left because we left, because they were there because of us, not because right. of Keith and Nancy. But then other people who moved to Albany who were in his inner circle or having sex with him or things like that, they have still, and some of them still haven't woken up because they haven't seen it for themselves, the inconsistencies, they cannot see the forest or the trees, and they're still under the indoctrination spell, for lack of a better word, 
and they will be until they have their own experience that will crack their own the veneer of that belief system, which is so rock solid at this point, especially in the in the wake of a, a trial and all the evidence out there. If they're refusing to look at that evidence or say that it's all a bunch of women lying, they're just digging their heels in more, and it makes that belief system even more solid. Yeah, and you can't wake people up who are pretending to be asleep. Uh, look, uh, this is <laughs> all line. fascinating. People are interested in this. They should check out HBO The Vow or buy your book, Scarred, Scarred or go to your, listen to your podcast. You have an amazing podcast, a little bit culty. I was able to find it on whatever app on the phone has all the, all the you know, pods, whatever it is. <laughs> podcast, we should know it's that. excellent. Um, <laughs> and you interview really interesting people on all things a little bit culty. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you. Sorry, we don't have yeah, ten hours, but uh, but yeah, people that do okay. should definitely invest in the show, in your podcast, and your book. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Thanks for having us on. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. We wow, wow again, right? Another wow. Um, really, really, it's, it's, really. It's tough to have incredible guests and have only an hour to talk to I, them about. It's and unbelievable. Talk. It really is. We have, to, we have to pick dollar guests, Bruce. Dollar guests. <laughs> dollar guests. Yeah, that'll that'll help us get through. <laughs> That's the not going to work with next week's guest. No, no. We have Aaron Moriarty of Forty Eight Hours Investigates. Exactly, and and she has covered crime for a considerable period of time. Uh, most interestingly, she has covered six. I think is that right? Six exonerations. Well. I, I, I can't count, but many. <laughs> many, many instances where uh, they investigate cases and the individuals that have been convicted end up being not guilty. Uh, so that's fascinating uh, coming from a, the perspective of a reporter who's, con- who's a lawyer, but she's a reporter on the outside looking in. I am looking forward to speaking to her and getting her perspective on our criminal justice system. We'll ask her some questions about criminal justice reform and the like. And uh, I'll get to chat with you again. Um, Next. Just- Monday night at 6 o'clock. Seven short days. (laughs) Great show. Good seeing you. We'll see you in a week. The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station, JVC Broadcasting Management, or its sponsors. Or its sponsors. Or its sponsors. Or its sponsors. Or its sponsors.